let's start over. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. To those of you online joining us, welcome back as well. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. We are on week five of the Is Genesis History series. Uh, we kick off week five this morning with uh, the global flood, the doctrine of judgment. And Mark will be bringing that message this morning. And then we'll follow up on Wednesday night by going deeper into that. So uh, we invite you to join us again on Wednesday night at 7 right here. October 10th is like... It, just like September last 10th. or September 10th, it's going to be October <laughs> before you know it. September 10th is our next racing. It seems like just a, a, a day two ago, it was like three weeks before that, but um, we've got that coming up. Um, it kind of neat. Uh, the, the young man who designed this car, his name is Jordan Teagues. Jordan uh, designed the car for Emerling Gase Racing yesterday at Darlington, the 35 car. And so he was pretty excited about that. He had his car design uh, racing on national did, TV. So that was the second time. Did race yesterday? Last I saw it was on home. Weather. I missed that. So they may not have, but his, his car design, the same guy that designed that is yeah. running, ran in Darlington on the uh, Everything Gates car. So I'm uh, real thrilled about that for him. And then a week following, so just two weeks out, we have our movie Tulsa which is September 17th. Uh, doors will open at 5.30. Movie will start eh, six-ish. <laughs> Depends on you know how much talking we're doing and how much eating of the good, yummy concessions that are free are, are going on there. Uh, we can have our biscuits and gravy. <laughs> I don't think we'll have the biscuits and gravy fountain yet by then. <laughs> oh, darn. For those of you that have no idea what we're talking about, my wife posted a picture of a fountain like the chocolate fountains but it had biscuits or gravy sausage gravy flowing through it so yeah. and and some, some of us were pretty excited about that i don't know how well the sausage would go through the pump but you know well, sausage was on the side was it on the side okay <laughs> i didn't look at it closely denny's, denny's on it i watched it multiple times <laughs> You know what? I, God's got to be smiling at us, going, "You guys are silly, worrying about a biscuit and gravy fun." But you know what? It's fun. It's 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 uh, something that brings us together, and that's what God wants to do: is bring us together as a family. And and this that kind of brings us into our call to worship this morning. But before we hear that, let's hear a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for the morning that you brought us this morning. Father, it is cool outside. We walked out, no air conditioning on. Drove here with the windows down, Father. It's a beautiful day. We thank you for the day that you have given us, Father. It's another day of life, another day for us to spend with you. Another day that we can uh, shine you, your light in this world. Another day that we can show the people of this world the hope that we have in you, Father. Let us know what we're doing each and every moment of the day so that in no way, shape, or form that we are not a reflection of you. We want to reflect you to everyone that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This morning's uh, call to worship comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. And this is from the New Living Translation. It says this, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Now, how many of you, and, and I'm going way off script here, how many of you heard the proverbial parents saying, I brought you into this world, I can take you out? <laughs> That's not what it's about. This, that, that is not what verse 3 is saying. This, this passage, these three verses are about a relationship between parents and their children and should be a reflection of our devotion to God. It should be a reflection of us as children of God with our Heavenly Father, our parent in heaven. Children who honor and respect their parents are also honoring God himself. There's, there's the important part. We're honoring God himself. And if our faith in Jesus Christ is real, 
it will prove itself out in our relationships, not just here at church or at work, but at home. When God is part of it, and I love the, the passage from, uh, and I'm just going to go blank. But uh, there's a passage in the Old Testament that talks about three chords. It's, verse, it's chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, and I am completely um, missing the name of the book for whatever reason. It's just blanking out on me. But it's imp the important part is not the book or the chapter or verses. It's the fact that there are three people involved in a covenant. Uh, my wife and I's covenant together was placed before God, including God in that making it much stronger and Mark's going to be talking about the flood and the doctrine of judgment today and there are consequences for our actions and God was really ticked at this point because children should honor their parents even if the parents are demanding and seemingly unfair we have to remember that. And also, parents should take care of their children, even if the children are annoying, disobedient, and rather irritating. Oh, you read my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> this is important. It's how, as Christians, we are meant to act. How God wants us to act. He wants us to be obedient to Him. But when God takes care of us, when he is watching over us throughout the Old Testament over and over again and even in, and right into the New Testament, if we have a relationship with him, if we are constantly seeking his face, he will take care of us as he took care of Noah. Father God, we thank you for the message that Mark is bringing to us this morning, the global flood. He's got it titled in his, that I can see right here, it says the global flood, God's wrath unleashed. Father, it was a wrath that had never been seen before and you promised would never be seen again. In fact, your promise we see all the time after a rain, Father, that beautiful rainbow that symbolizes your promise to us, nothing else but your promise to us that you would never do that again. Father, we need to be righteous as Noah was righteous. We need to follow you and be obedient to you. And even if we don't understand what you're asking us to do, we need to follow that. Because it may not happen in our lifetimes. It may be our children or our children's children or further down. But Father, you were always faithful. You always do what you said you were going to do. You always bless the way that you say that you will bless. Let us hear these words that you've given to Mark this morning. Let them work through us, Father, and let us take them out with us as we go out into the world, shining in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Vicki. I'm going to turn you down. <laughs> Good morning, church. Kind of fun this one. I don't know. I'm crazy. Uh, obviously, if you follow along with the call to worship, you're going, okay, we're talking about the global flood. So Mark picks out Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, children, obey your parents. Yeah. Anybody see the connection there? Okay, maybe it's just me. So, the global flood, God's wrath unleashed. God's wrath unleashed. If we think about that, that, that really brings... A lot of things into the picture now from our days in in Sunday school at kids we probably saw a picture of Noah's Ark that looked like this you know happy smiling little animals popping heads everybody's smiling great time oh boy we had a fun time here everybody's holding hands and having a great time but really truly when we look at what it was it was a cataclysmic flood of literally biblical proportions and that is more like the picture of what it was like now that's what it's like if you're in the ark but if you were not one of the chosen that was a inside the ark you had a much different experience and if you look on the faces of the people in the water in there and i know for you people online it's kind of tough to see this but I want you to understand it's it's not happy smiling faces everybody holding hands and singing kumbaya 
So it's, it was not, it was not a great, happy experience. It was God's wrath unleashed. And I want you to understand that. And I kind of want you to keep this picture in mind as we're talking about this today, because this was the last straw for God. It was the last straw. We're going to learn about that today. But this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's not all gloom and doom. Well, as Terry was talking to you about this on here, and we were talking about parents, and, and uh, I had to kind of laugh back there, because if we take a look at the front end of this sermon that I wrote today, it, it talks about exactly what he was talking about. We as parents know what it's like to have unruly kids. And one only needs to go to Walmart to witness this in action. I mean, we've all been there, and some are worse than others. Tantrums, behavior unfit for public consumption, and disrespectful, lying, cheating, stealing. And it's enough to ask the question, why did I, or we, or they, ever have children? And what was I, or we, or they, thinking? I mean, it gets to that point to you going, wow, what's going on? And they know exactly what to do. Pushing our very last button, and then they smile about it. Oh, man, that's enough to send you up and over the top if anything else was. Been there, right? Uh -huh. Diane's back there going, oh, yeah. But despite all those things and all of the bad things, they're still our children, right? And we love them despite the issues, despite the problems, despite any of those things going on, we still love them. They're enough to drive us off the cliff in one moment and angels a moment later. So what do you do if you're a parent? What do you do as a parent? Well, A, we can just, and I've seen this over and over again at Walmart, ignore it. It's just a phase. No, they'll get, they'll, they'll get over it. Punishment? Well, if so, what and how much? Now, I remember as a kid, and this happened very, 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 very infrequently, but I remember being chased around the backyard with this guy with a belt in his hand. But you know what? <laughs> Made me a really good runner. So, you know, you got that going for you. So, item number C then would be, we can love on them and pray that they change. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. My point is, we as parents, we've got options, choices decisions that we make what if it just doesn't work then what then what see we think we made all the good choices we gave them good examples we taught them right from wrong but still we got that bad behavior that we got to deal with and it becomes maddening it's maddening isn't it and it's a lot to have to deal with so let's look at what God had to deal with. See, God is our Father in heaven. God created man. He created his children underneath him. And they all behave perfectly, right? Yeah. So let's see what God had to deal with. So as we talked about in the last couple of weeks, God created this beautiful, beautiful paradise. Filled it with all kinds of creatures, all kinds of good foods, grains, everything that the people would need to thrive everything they would need to live in eternity remember what i said last week there was no death there was no pain there was no sickness it was paradise and they were meant to live for an eternity they were meant to live for an eternity in paradise just stop a moment and think about that just stop a moment and think about that what would it be like live for eternity in paradise no pain no 
no sickness, no stress, no employees you have to manage. Hmm. Whew, yeah. Paradise, right? I'm up for that. How about you? Yeah, sounds like a pretty good thing to me. Wow, then it happened. Then it happened. They blew it. They did exactly what their Father God told them not to do. Parents, sound familiar, right? Never happens. Sounds like a kid. Well, that's exactly what they were. Our call to worship today says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Now, this second part of it, I really, really like. So it says, if you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. And you will live a long time on earth. Now, that's a promise. And as Terry said, God brought you into this world and I can take you out. Not that my father would ever say anything like that, nor would I ever give him cause to say anything close to that. Right, Dad? <laughs> Stoically silent. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we kind of missed the, missed the mark on that one. And just like we do, God had choices to make and choose he did. Which then brings us to the flood. So let's step back and take a look at history before the flood. We need to understand what was going on, what the people were like, and you know, kind of get that backstory in order, in order to understand why God had made the choice that he made. That period in time is called the Antediluvian Epoch, and it literally means before the flood. And it refers to that time period before the flood that's recorded in Genesis 6 through 8. The righteous people who lived before Noah's time were called the Antediluvian Patriarchs. And those men are listed in Genesis 5. And they include Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Enoch, and Methuselah. Now, Methuselah lived to be 900 and 69 years old. Yeah, 969 years old. And that makes him the oldest person on record. The word antediluvian has also come to mean extremely old or out of date. So and sometimes you'll hear of, of people having antediluvian ideas, you know, way out of date. They're out of touch with what's going on in reality today. So, but this is where it comes from, being very, very old, very, being very aged or out of date. We know that from the genealogies listed in Genesis 1 through 6, that people lived much, much longer in antediluvian times than they do now. Adam, who was the first man, lived to be 930 years old. We find that in Genesis 5.5. 5. His son Seth lived to be 912 years old, and we find that in Genesis 5.8. The length of the antediluvian period, as I talked about last week in, in the message last week, based upon all these genealogies and people when they were born and when they died, they have now kind of narrowed it down to about 1,656 years. So that was quite a long time. As we kind of talked about last week in Genesis, when we learn it in Sunday school, we're kind of going through there and, you know, God created everything and then they ate the apple and then they were kicked out of the garden and, you know, that all happened within a matter of days. But it's kind of neat to look at the timelines of what happened and put it all into play. My point here is, is that 600, 1,656 years passed between the time that Adam was created and the antediluvian period came to an end. And it came to an end with the flood. Now Satan, Satan started the whole thing off. He intervened in the garden and caused the fall. Satan was a fallen angel, and there are many other fallen angels as well, as we read in the scriptures. And according to the narratives, 
Satan wasted no time in gathering fallen followers. They were the minions of Satan and did his bidding, and they were literally hell-bent on further corrupting mankind. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on as well. But not all were corrupted. Not all men created were corrupted. And a significant change in human behavior occurred during that antediluvian period. During that 1656 years, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And we find that in Genesis 4, 6. So at that point in time, we, we had people who were the minions of Satan going out there and trying to corrupt as many people as they could. And yet you had followers, a full bloodline of followers during that 1656 years that were calling on the name of the Lord. They wanted to follow God and they were doing right things in the eyes of God. And this fact is linked with the birth of Seth and then his son Enosh, indicating that with the birth of Enosh going forward, the family of Seth became, uh, began to separate themselves from the wickedness, from the corruption of the world around them. They, they isolated themselves and they were known as the people who worshiped the Lord during those points. Genesis 5 tells us then that the genealogy of the line of Adam, uh, as it came down through, takes us all the way up to Noah. And we need to have that broken string, and it needs to be pointed out as we go through. And that becomes very, very important later on, because that then follows through with the rest of the story, with the rest of the Bible, and takes us all the way up to Jesus' birth. And we can follow that bloodline all the way back to the first Adam. So, through the scriptures, they tell us that Noah was a good and faithful servant. And he served God well. And God trusted him. Now, not all the people were going this way. During this time period, the general trend of humanity was spiritual decline. And the, by the beginning of chapter 6, verse 5, it says that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now, that doesn't mean that they just have bad thoughts once around, but look at what it says here, that every inclination of the thought of the human heart, they did nothing but exude evil. All of their thoughts were based on evil. Not good. Every inclination of the heart. They pointed that out specifically because that shows how bad things were, how evil men had become. Well, Satan was on the rise and his minions were doing the best to undo what God had done. And that was creating that paradise for man to live in. They wanted to undo God. In the process. The antediluvian period was also the time of the Nephilim, or the Bible also refers to them as the Nephilites. And these were heroes of old, the men of renown, who were the offspring of an unholy union between the sons of God and the daughters of men. And Genesis 6 4 says that they were purported to be Satan's minions, fallen angels. That's who these sons of men were at that time. But whatever the exact nature of the Nephilim was at that point in time, they were one of the reasons that God decided that he had to destroy everything with the flood. Every creature that breathed air and lived on the earth had to be destroyed. And you say, well, the animals didn't do anything wrong. It was men. Men were the ones that were evil. Every inclination of their heart was evil. But not the dogs, not the birds of the air, but see, God created one ecosystem on top of the other and they supported life all the way down. And he knew that. So should any of that survive, then man may be able to survive. And so he had to destroy every living, breathing creature upon the earth that walked the earth. 
but Noah and his wife were not of the Nephilim race. And see, then they could be repopulating the earth as God intended it to be in the first place. See, God had a plan. He, was, he had a redemption plan through Noah and his wife and their family. Because they weren't of that Nephilim race. They, they weren't of that evil, that born and bred evil of Satan. Jesus had alluded to the antediluvian period when he predicted signs of his second coming. We find that in Matthew 24, 37 to 39. That says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what was to happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's how it will be at the second coming of man. When Jesus comes, there will be another cataclysmic event that will take that and transform the earth. So I want you to go back to that picture and think about that. Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came. That's why I really like this picture is these people are struggling to try and survive, but it's hopeless for them. They have no hope. They will not survive. The length and breadth of the flood, the storms were such a degree to where no living, breathing creature could survive. They were hopeless, desolate to die. The end of the living period was unique in human history, a, tong, a time of long lifespans and bodies that were near perfection. Wouldn't you love one of those? I know I would. <laughs> Adam lived through more than half of that antediluvian period and was presumably available to recount firsthand the accounts of Eden to anyone who is interested enough to listen. So if we think about that, we had Adam who walked with Jesus in the garden. He could tell him firsthand, man, it was paradise. It was great. We had it all. We blew it, but we had it all. Think about that. Could, could you imagine walking and talking with him? You had to think he was passing on how he made a bad decision. And how not to do it again. Because you got to understand, he, he probably understood that he really messed up bad. But it didn't take long for wickedness to grow to an ex such an extent that God had to destroy it all. Let's go to Genesis 6, 1 through 7. And the Bible title said in my Bible, a world gone wrong. Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and the daughters were born to them. The sons of God, fallen angels, saw the beautiful woman and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth for Whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he ever made them and put them on the earth, and it broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing. All the people, all the large animals, all the small animals that scurry along the ground. And even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. Wow. Now you really had to be an upset parent to get to that point, right? We talked about that earlier when I first started out the message. Well, kids, you got God mad. Guess what? 
here comes the punishment. And the choice was made. So let's go back to Genesis 6, 8 and take a look at this. It says, but Noah found favor with the Lord. So we have the story of Noah and the flood. And this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the face of the earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world for everyone on the earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar, inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. And put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat. Lower, middle, and upper. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat. You and your wife and your sons and their wives. And bring a pair of every kind of animal, male and female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground. They will come to you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all those animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded them. Think about this. Now, I want you to concentrate on that very last line. And it says, so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Can you imagine that? God saying, build this monstrously large boat, fill it with all these animals, and by the way, bring enough food to keep you and all the animals alive during this period of time, and I will redeem your family. I will redeem you. And it's a story of redemption. And it's a great example of how God had a redemption plan in mind for man. Have you ever read this story about Noah and the boat and thought about this as a redemption plan, a precursor to what was to come by him sending his son Jesus to save our sins, to take on all of the sins, all of the injustice, all of the corruption of man? This was the first redemption story. Genesis chapter 7 tells us of the nature of the flood, how long it lasted, and it leaves nothing alive that lived and breathed on the earth, except what God had instructed for Noah to put on the ark. And it was the end of the epic. The end of all things created. That's really important for us to understand. That was the end of all things created. The paradise of man was now gone, never to be brought back. So now we have the rest of the story. And we call this period the post-Diluvian period, which brings us all the way up to the present day. It actually means after the flood. And after the flood, God promised Noah that he would never again flood the entire earth. The symbol of that promise is a rainbow. We find that in Genesis 9, 12 through 17. And that first rainbow signified the end of the antediluvian era and demonstrated God's great mercy in giving humanity another chance to know him, another chance to live. 
And every rainbow since then is a continual reminder of God's grace and his never-ending love. Because it was because of that grace and because of that love that we're here today. Otherwise, there, we wouldn't be here. He would have wiped everything clean and started over again. He's God and he could do it. But that's not what he intended for us. God is a good father. And he has set forth the path to enable those who follow him, have faith in him, and worship him to have a place with him in heaven for eternity. That's important. That's important to know. Yeah, I got chased around the yard with a belt. You know, that was a temporary thing. And I was a good runner after that. But this is something that goes on for eternity. God has set forth a path to enable them, anyone who follows him, anyone that has faith in him, and will worship him, to have a place with him in heaven for eternity. It never ends. And heaven is a paradise place that he has created specifically for us. Sound familiar? That's what we intended to get in the first place. But we blew. Having seen the extent to which man could fall and left him in his own devices, and having given man free will to make choices, God put the plan in place to give mankind a second chance. And see, the rest of the Bible is the story of that plan and how mankind it still messes up. Still messes up. So if man's history is made up of God wiping all of the creatures off the face of the earth, why do people take this today? They just don't take it seriously. I mean, the fossil records are there. Everything else is proved out. We know that it's true. And yet, we have people who just fall away. Uh, it's, it's, can't believe it, just stories, stories in a book. So what keeps us falling away from God and his word? What keeps us falling away from God and his word? As we read through the books of the Bible, you have to wonder why there hasn't been another cataclysmic event already. And these are all good and pertinent questions. If we look at our world today, we really are not that far off from what we read in Genesis 6, are we? If we look around today, look around at the violence, the corruption, the senseless killings, the political turmoil, divisiveness, religious fanaticism that goes on, separation from God. We are now facing entire generations of young people who know of God, but who do not know God. They don't know him. They don't have a personal relationship from him. Yeah, you hear it all the time. I hear it from people. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. When was the last time you were in church? I go every Easter and every Christmas. Okay? And just by going to church once in a while, does that make you a Christian? No. You have to have a relationship with God. You have to have that connection to God. As God is a good father, he set forth a path to enable those who follow him, have faith in him, and worship him to have a place with him in heaven for eternity. Saying you're a Christian and not doing the rest of it, not having the relationship, not having what it takes to have that relationship with God, to have faith in him, to worship him, will not get you into heaven. Period. There's a lot of people, a lot of people who know who God is, but who don't follow God. They don't worship Him. They don't have a place in their heart for Him. They haven't made a place in their heart for Him. And that's critical to understand. I'd already turned it down up here for you, too. <laughs> So when we think about this, if we remember back to what I read before, in that antediluvian time, the general trend of humanity back then was spiritual decline. The general trend of humanity right now 
is spiritual decline. And as such, it has to beg that question. Are we in the end times now? If we look into the scriptural prophecies of the end times, it'd be hard to argue that we aren't too far off. The scriptures are very clear. There will be a coming judgment of mankind. In our study, it tells us about God's global condemnation and judgment. Since animals are designed to fill niches in the ecosystem, if God desires to kill all animals, he has to destroy all of those ecosystems along with it. And I alluded to that, that earlier. To do that requires a global judgment. Water is the best choice. It's a cleansing agent that wipes out all life while transforming and not only destroying the material of the earth as it was in the first judgment. So if you're gonna do this and you have an intent to rebuild, you flood it with water because the earth itself did not get consumed. The earth itself that you created did not get destroyed and it will support life again. Fire on the other hand, destroys everything. Revelation talks about the end times when Jesus returns and it's not a pretty picture for those who do not know God and have a faith and a relationship with him. Do not have that relationship with him. This judgment will be far worse than the flood. He will bring a fire that will consume the earth and everything in it and everything on it. Total destruction. We've been warned. We've been told exactly what we need to do to be spared this judgment. Then God sends the second Adam, born without sin and living a pure life, giving us an example that man can live a sinless life if he chooses to do so. Remember, I've been talking for a couple of years about the choices that we have to make. And the choices we make determines what our eternity is going to be. Life ends eternity where is a choice we have to make. And this is exactly what I've been talking about. God is a good father. He has set forth a path to enable those who follow him, have faith in him, and worship him to have a place with him and in heaven for eternity. Are you and yours ready? Let us pray. Please join in me with this prayer that's on the screen. Holy Lord, who sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, to save us, I pray today to be reconciled to you. For your word tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, and the new has come. Lord God, I pray to live in Christ, but I am weak. Give me the strength to let go of my worldly desires and instead follow where Jesus leads. May I be made new in Christ, to be reconciled to you, Lord God, and to be forgiven of my sins through your great mercy and grace. Gracious God, I glorify your wonderful name that there is now no condemnation and that my reconciliation with you, God Almighty, is permanent and eternal. For the wrath of God was poured out upon the innocent life of Lord Jesus, who took my place so that I could be brought back into fellowship with you and to be reconciled with you, Lord God. Let us praise your wonderful name.
So I was thinking about communion this morning. It's such that thinking about the parent and the child and a child who disobeys his parent. And in, in Matthew 26, verse 20, Jesus says this as he sits down at the table with the 12. He says, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. If you're a parent, at some point, in some form or fashion, your child has betrayed you. Some way or another. It happens. Yet we love our children regardless. And this is how much Jesus loved them. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And when he broke it into pieces, he gave it to his disciples saying this. He said, take this and eat it. For this is my body. And then he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and he said this, Each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Not only is he offering us hope, he's offering us redemption in that hope. The body of Christ broken. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Heavenly Father, it is through this, this sacrament, this, this meal that we have taken, this eating of the bread and drinking of the cup, that we are reminded that Jesus sacrificed everything for us. He did it even for those who will never know him as their personal Savior because you want no one to perish. Father, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Denise is out of town. Steve and Denise are in uh, Illinois visiting Steve's mom. Um, but we want to make sure that we pray for Steve. Steve traveled all that way after falling the other day and dis severely dislocating his shoulder to the point where they had to put him under in order to put it back. I can't, I, that just, I can't imagine. But Steve's, Steve's a guy. Steve's, Steve's tough. He's been through a lot. He has been through a lot recently. And, and so we want to keep him in prayer. On a praise side, Don texted me this morning. He didn't get home from work last night until after 2. So he was very tired this morning, so he didn't join us. But he's very, very thankful for the prayers. That dizziness that he's been experiencing has waned. Yay. And he is feeling better. And he feels those prayers are working. And he thank, wants to thank everyone for those. Are there any other prayers or praises that we want to bring before? Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we are so privileged to be your children. We are so honored that we can pray for people when they are sick or injured, when they have some terrible disease, whether it is curable or incurable, Father, you give us the opportunity to bring them before you and pray for them. Father, we give thanks for all the praises that we've had, including such as Don, who feels those prayers. know that our prayers are heard. In the years since we planted this ministry and started this church, Father, we have seen countless times where those prayers have been answered. And we thank you. We are humbled 
that you would trust us with these prayers and that we can come before you and lift people up to you. In Jesus' name. This brings us to the conclusion of our online portion of our service today. And we thank you for joining us online. We do invite you to come and join us in person and, and fellowship with us as well. Um, this morning when I was I came in early to prepare for the service and the little reminder that came up on the on the computer as I fired it up, it says rain's coming. Rain's coming. Now they didn't predict rain for the rest of the week. That little reminder came up in that display. Today it says rain's coming. What a perfect indicator for the message for today. And it's so true. Rain's gonna come. It's not the kind of rain that we like. We're gonna be brought to judgment. But thank God that Jesus gave us a way to be with him and to be saved from that rain of fire. So as we go into the week ahead, Lord, I just ask that you would have a hedge of protection around all of us, not just physically, Lord, but mentally. Help us to be spared from the barbs and arrows and the slings of a toxic world, a world, Lord, that is meant to separate us from you. I ask today that you would grant us your peace, grant us your goodness that we could pass it on to others. Grant to the living grace to the departed rest. Most of all, to our nation, peace and harmony. God, grant to us, your servants, the promise of that everlasting life, light to guide us on our way, and courage to support each other in grace and mercy. Lord, give us your blessing to unite us in service to you, to our God into our church to our church family let us go forth into this world in peace in hope and in love wholly dedicated to your service lord you spoke to us today you gave us all the reasons why now embolden us to do what you have asked us to do lord let us hold fast to that which is good strengthen us the faint-hearted Support the weak, help the needy and the afflicted, and bring honor to all people through you and through your love. Let us love and serve you, Lord, rejoicing in the power of your Holy Spirit. And may God's blessing be upon us and remain with us always. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray today.